Ah, good morning, everybody um, from Australia, where I am this morning. And a, a grand hello to <clears throat> everyone from around the world, and particularly my guest, Felicia Davis, for the Remarkable Women Powerful Stories uh, seminar or webinar today. Um, it's, it's a fabulous morning here, and I'm hoping you've had a lovely day wherever you are around the world or you're just starting your day. I'm Lynn Foley, the chairman of the Zonta International Leadership Development Committee, and I'm hosting this series, and it's a significant highlight every month on my calendar. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also pay that respect to any First Nations people present. Zonta International, as I'm sure everyone knows, is a leading global organisation of professionals empowering women worldwide through service and advocacy. Zonta is now in its second century and has more than 28,000 members in 64 countries working together to make gender equality a worldwide reality for women and girls. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Felicia to you. Felicia is joining me from Chicago, um, along with the, the Zonta International team who's supporting the webinar today. Firstly, a, few, a picture of some of your achievements, Felicia, before we get into the, the conversation. Felicia has told me she's a self-described girl from the South Side, and she's deeply committed to her community through inclusive service to others. As president and chief executive of Chicago Foundation for Women, she leads their strategic efforts in investing in women and girls as catalysts, building stronger communities for all. Felicia is also passionate about transforming lives and serves as an educator and mentor through a variety of networks and on many boards and committees. She's been in public service for the majority of her career so far uh, at the police department in Chicago, interim president of the Olive Harvey College and an inaugural executive director of the Office of Public Engagement in Mayor Rahm Emanuel's administration, where she led efforts to connect communities to resources. So as a Greater Chicago Fellow and a founding member of the Chicago Foundation for Women's Southside Giving Circle, you have indeed placed a trail for supporting black women and girls through philanthropy and collective giving. So it's my great pleasure to start our conversation today. So welcome to you, Felicia. Hi, Lynn. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's our absolute pleasure. So, I find that your career and professional achievements are just so inspiring and you've worked so many areas of public service, as I've already said. I'd like to start today with what and who motivated you to become this powerful influencer and change agent? Uh, I'm interested to share with all of our guests today where it all began for you. Well, I am eager to talk about that, but I have to first also give a land acknowledgement um, Chicago is located on the traditional uh, homelands of the Council of Free Fires, the Ojibwe, Odua, Potawatomi Nations, many other tribes such as the Miami Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sauk, and Fox also call it this area home. So I um, wanted to make sure I did that straight away. Thank you, Lynn, for modeling that um, 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 example. So it all starts um, with my mom. I'll be quite honest with you, Lynn. Um, we had the opportunity to talk a little bit. She is still alive because when I talk about her, sometimes my mother has said, you talk about me, people think I'm passed away. She's very much alive and she um, is probably listening right now um, because <laughs> she, she really um, instilled in me a lot and she was wise beyond her years. She was the first person to teach me about intersectionality before it was a word about my identity as both woman, but also as being black and what that means. She, um, you know, we were a family that had a great many challenges, not unlike girls growing up in some of our communities today here in Chicago and particularly in some of the communities on the South side where I come from. Um, but she was very clear eyed and telling me that I had a responsibility to and for others. So even despite our meager circumstances growing up, she really did instill in me the sense of obligation and um, this collective, this real sense of collective well being for others that goes beyond. Um, and it's kind of what I do every day now, how it's being to challenge people as to what it means to be a philanthropist, because it's not just about million dollar gifts. It is about everyday people, in our case, um, giving their time, talent, and treasure to really help shape our communities the way that they, the communities themselves, um, want to see. 
Wow. So um, that the influence of of a mum really, and um, and and I know that uh, when we first had the opportunity, when I first met you a little while ago, Felicia, we talked about the importance of education for you and your family, and how that enables us all to have a good and secure life. Perhaps you might like to explore that with us from your experience, and how that education is an essential catalyst for the progress on women's rights because I'm sure as we progress through this morning we will certainly be talking about gender and and women's rights so so explore that with me yeah and I you know we acknowledge you and Island that education when we think about women around the world and girls around the world it is something that many of them don't have access to it is um, something that in many places girls have to fight um, they're prohibited. Um, either they age out or just outright because of their gender. And so um, in our case, growing up, my mother, she had dropped out of high school when she became pregnant with me. So she hadn't really um, attained um, a great deal as it relates to educational achievement, but she always talked about the importance of education. She always stressed that I'm the oldest of four kids and she talked about it all the time. And at one point, when I was still um, preteen, my mother had a conversation with herself. She talks about it, and um, but she came to us and she said, "If I tell you education is important, then I have to show you." And my mother went back to school to get her GED. And so, for I think Dr. Thompson, who's here today, who I've never met, my mother went to Olive Harvey to get her GED. And so, for me growing up, that's for you all. Um, um, not in Chicago. That's one of our community college system, uh, one of our community colleges, and it happened to be located in the community that I grew up. And to me, growing up, it was also a place where the community went for lots of resources. To me, it was very a vital part of our neighborhood and our community. I went there for summer camps and things like that as a little girl. And when she went back to school, I mean, some of us, some of us have had to do this during the pandemic in, in a sense, she had to take us with her. She didn't have a babysitter. Um, and so she had to take us with her. And to the credit of the staff, the women, I remember the women at the college, they didn't turn her away. Instead, they welcomed and they created a learning environment for me, my sister and I. And then my mother was able to also um, achieve and subsequently receive her general education diploma, which is in the state's high school equivalency and also then continue on and go to college. And that act, and that single act, one, it's brave on my mother's part and it taught me so much about resilience. And I get a little teary-eyed every time I think about it because I could feel how much it changed our lives. I could feel the way in which mm. that, that attainment, that goal, the achievement of that one single goal, right? Created a whole nother set of circumstances in our lives it created the conditions by which then I became the first person in my family to go to college and get a college degree. Like it created the circumstances where then the next generation, my kids were expected to go to college without question. It wasn't even a, a thing in that single act. And that's why there's so much power I find in supporting women and girls. I mean, especially as it relates to education because when we educate a girl or a woman, right? We actually do educate a whole family and we can change the trajectory of that entire family. I have teared up because I that, that power of education and your story about it has made me tear up and I don't tear up easily either, Felicia. And I'm an educator by trade as many people who are regular watchers of this webinar know. And I learned that myself too. And it's not about me, but you know, look, winning scholarships to go to university and to be empowered. And I, I understand that. And it's, it's really tough for people who are watching from Australia and, and areas of the Southern Hemisphere, a community college in the USA is quite similar to a TAFE college or a vocational education college in, in our country and in other countries. So it is often the first enabler for people to get a diploma or a, a graduation or to enable them to go on further or to go into really great work. So that's fabulous. Yes, that education and Zondra International, of course, um, has so many projects they work on, uh, particularly in the other countries, third world countries mainly, that is about opening access to girls and women, but particularly girls to the education. Uh, and it's an amazing. So, You've given service 
and it, it, you describe in your bio and in the conversations we've had, your life has been about giving service based on that education that you you had as a young person. How does this? How has that underpinned your career decisions? Uh, I'll, I'll digress a little into career because you had um, quite a career in the Chicago Police Department and in other places before you came to the foundation. So can you um, explore that a little, I think, and unpack the whole notion of service uh, for you? I, uh, certainly. I, um, I'll start with uh, a little bit of a joke, I guess. Some recently, mm -hmm. well, before COVID, when we were meeting people mm -hmm. in person, I was at um, an event speaking to some young people um, who were younger in their career, and they asked me, how can I, they were in one of the college persistence programs, and the question was, how does one become president of a foundation? And my answer was, well, you work at the police department for 10 years, and then you go and you work in higher education <laughs> for 10 years, and then you go work in government for another 10 years, and right, because that's <laughs> what I did. Um, but, but truthfully, this, you know, when I talked about the fact that my mother really stressed this responsibility that I have, we have to and for each other, and um, that kind of collective well being. Um, a lot today, you know, people are talking a lot about mutual aid and how people come to the aids of others. Um, it just really set something in me, I think, and also because. I do feel, I mean, as an adult, but I, I haven't just felt this as I've been an adult, I have felt this way for a very long time, that even as I've had lots of challenges in my life, um, growing up in poverty, right, living in public housing and, and, and those types of things, I've also had immense blessings I've always felt in my life as well. And so I think it resonated with me to always pay it back or in the case, or, you know, the current belief or thinking pay it forward by being of service and helping others. And so the common thread through all of those things, while people are like, wow, these, these things don't really have anything to do with each other. Each one of the career professions that I've worked in have been about extending myself in service of others. And that's the thread throughout. So whether it's, it was um, in law enforcement when I was a member of the Chicago Police Department for 10 years, to me, it was about being in service in that community um, a lot of times people are calling for police services because they don't know who else to call. It's not necessarily because a crime has been committed, or at least in the case of Chicago, it's so many other things and they don't know who else can come, who else will show up. And at least in Chicago, we respond, you know, the, the Chicago police respond to more of those calls. And it was really about helping people figure out the connections. And that's when I learned how the community, like what's really important in the community context, like the information sharing and trying mm -hmm. to connect people to resources um, in which I later did in the mayor's office as well, starting the office of public engagement there, knowing that there's a gap between government and everyday residents who don't really understand how mm -hmm. the largesse of government systems work for their benefit. Mm. Yes, it's the, um, the notion of service through I guess through broad government and higher education and large organisations uh, is very important because often or quite often you have that um, power, the collective power, don't you, of um, funds and people and, and authority, uh, like an authorising environment to give service. And, um, and that doesn't diminish the fact that so many individuals give individual service as well by helping one woman at a time or one girl at a time or one family at a time. So it's, it's a connection, collection of all of it really, isn't it? A collective to, to give service uh, in, in our communities, the collective of Zonta, the collective of the foundation and the collective of government. So that's amazing. Inside of all of that, this notion of gender equality and the fact that so many parts of the world and so many women's and generations of women before yourself and myself have really strived to that elusive state. And it seems to me it's still quite elusive, that state of gender equality. What do you think needs to happen to escalate that process or, or to get faster progress? What are some of the touchstones of, I guess, strategy and policy to get us there? That's a really good, that is a really good question, Lynn, and it's probably the, I don't know, hundred trillion dollar question, because if we get there, 
so many things change just in our region in Chicago. If we just on one metric, just on pay, on pay parity, if we had gender pay parity in our region, that would be $5.8 billion that would be created in our um, local economy and our GDP. And that's just little, you know, little Chicago. So that's just one part of it. And that's just one aspect of it. So in some respects, you know, the work that we do every day, Chicago Foundation for Women, has, this is our 36th year. And to your point, sometimes it feels like we haven't made that much progress when it comes to these things. But then there are days when you see things like, you know, in Chicago, at least, um, from a political standpoint, we have um, our city, there is a generation of girls who are growing up with a mayor who's African American, with a treasurer um, who is also African American and a city clerk, the three highest office offices in our city, um, who's a Latina, and then a Cook County Board President who's a black woman and a Lieutenant Governor for the state of Illinois who is a black woman. So at least from political representation, right? There is a generation of girls in our region who are growing up and who are seeing that. And then for the United States, you know, the second highest office, we're not like some other countries around the world um, where they have actually elected a woman to or appointed a woman to their highest office, but at least here for now, in the second highest office of the land, we have an intersectional, wonderful woman who is um, African, you know, Black, African American, and also um, um, Asian American um, in the office. And so we have another generation of girls in our country who are growing up and seeing that as, as the model. But when we look at the data, when, when we look at things like paid sick leave, I mean, unfortunately, the United States is only one of 11 countries in the world who doesn't have um, uh, a, a guaranteed you know, uh, paid leave for everyone. And we talked about that a little bit and what that means. Um, and so it's unequal. We still continue to have um, pay disparities and pay gap, dis gap disparities. And it's important, you know, it's different for white women than it is for black women, than it is for Latina women, than it is for Asian women um, and native women, right? These disparities, but they persist year over year. Um, there is lots of research around um, how women are promoted and are hired. Men are promoted for future potential. Women are hired, oh, he can be a go-getter. Those same traits in women are looked at negatively or when she is hired, it's because she has done every single thing in a job description. And in a lot of cases, it's like, we think that the guy can do it. So, you know, and I know that uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright um, United States Secretary of State Albright once said, you know, there's a lot of room in the world for um, mediocre men, not a lot of room in the world for mediocre women, right? So mm -hmm. we have had some um, successes over the, the, the years of pressing for um, uh, advancement and gender equity, but we still have some challenges. And when you look at it around the world, certainly there continue to be um, great number of challenges, mm -hmm. access to voting, um, global the issues with global warming and climate change, those are impacting women first in a lot of places. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to do. Yes, I, I agree with you, a lot of work to do. It's generally agreed that the quest for gender equality it should be in partnership with men. It's not just about women leading it. What are your thoughts on how we can engage men more broadly? So I, you know, I talk about this a lot because I talk to, you have to do this work. You talk to a number of men um, and particularly in the United States, white men who still chiefly hold a lot of the power. And one of the things that I don't, I, that a lot of folks don't understand is that these inequities hurt them too. These inequities hurt us all. They create systems that really hurt us all. I talked about, you know, what it would look like for um, women to be paid equitably in our region. And what I say to men a lot is that that means your wife, your daughter, your sister, any, the women that you love too, this isn't, you know, this isn't a guess, this is based in fact, that they too are being paid inequitably. They too are having, so that means you are also being cheated by this. And then you make a bigger connection, you know, thinking about the ways in which society is being cheated by this. But then on the other hand, when we have a gap in opportunity and we leave half of our potential and half of our 
um, players on the table, we're losing. We have to have everyone, you know, the world is facing some really big, big challenges. And we have to have all of the potential to address those problems. So that means girls and you know women, in addition to men being tapped and identified and believed and trusted and sought out for their advice and counsel as we tackle those things. Yes, absolutely. Uh, when you and I first met, we talked about COVID and the effect of COVID-19 across our world and particularly your experience of that. Um, we're all hopeful we're emerging into that post-COVID world, but I can't see it Even here in Australia. We've had, um, you know, a, a further higher statistics. And before I ask the question, I think it's really important for me to mention and to say to everyone who's listening and watching us this morning, I do hope you're well and I do hope you're coping in your country because so many countries are really struggling with uh, the pandemic still with um, it, you know, the, the ebb and flow of, of statistics and numbers and, and illness. So I do want to reach out to everyone today and say, um, I'm thinking of you and I think of everyone around while I'm well of the people who are struggling and struggling with employment and everything. So with that thought, the pandemic's had a lot of particular and disproportionate impacts on women and continues to do so. Um, the data says that and the rhetoric says that. What do you think are those effects and, and what are your reflections for policymakers and for all of us on making a difference as we still struggle with the pandemic, let alone not having gone to the post-COVID world? Yeah, this is a really important question. And this everyone who's tuned in this morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world, um, this is a question for you too, because it is how do we stand up to this moment, this big moment that demands so much of us. We have an opportunity to see change that we have not seen heretofore in our lifetimes. We have that opportunity right now, because at least in the United States, but I also looking at the information from other countries, COVID has revealed, really highlighted the inequities that were already pre-existing, the things that we don't want to talk about. The fact that care work is overwhelmingly dependent upon women, which means our economy is overwhelmingly dependent on women in order for it to thrive. And in the United States, at least, and I talked about the fact that we don't have paid leave for, for everyone here and access to that, our economy virtually came to a standstill because we did not have the ability to provide care, which means that women had these choices. They had to choose between their families and the safety of their families or the health and wellness of their families and going out and earning an income and overwhelmingly. And sometimes, and that's not really a choice, right? It's a false choice um, because there's harm on either side of that trying to decide which one to do. But of course, you know, I'm a mother, um, I'm a woman, it's family first. I mean, even if I weren't a mother, I grew up in a family and was taught by my mother, family above everything else, right? We have a loving family. Um, and so that's just, that's just one aspect of it. So some of the things that we learned was how important it is for caregivers to be supported and protected and compensated. Some things we learned were, I think for women, all of us, I think we learned, hopefully, hopefully, I'm gonna knock on wood y'all, hopefully what we learned was to say no and to think about prioritization of things, right? We were all kind of forced to sit still for a minute <laughs> or a year and many, many months um, and be in our thoughts and to think about things. And hopefully we walk out with a new set of priorities about what's really important and that that helps when we think about our consumer behavior decisions, right? Where are we purchasing things? When we think about how we go out and entertain each other, restaurants and those things that were prohibited theater, the things that we love, but that we couldn't do for over a year, and the space that we had with our families over these last um, year and a half or so. So hopefully that's helped us to center those things. But it's also changed work in some very fundamental ways. For all those corporations that are like, we well, could never, we could never be 100% remote work. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so, and, or, you know, who didn't want it, they thought, oh, that's just a way for people to be absent and get a paycheck without working. All of those like false troops 
have been proven false. There can be high productivity and so forth. It requires us to think a little bit differently um, as managers, even in companies and organizations to think a little bit about what productivity really is because it's not face time, right? It, that doesn't equate to um, the outcomes and, 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 and objectives necessarily. So, um, and the other thing that I think, and I hope that we, the people who are here today, I had this before COVID, I am, um, you know, a thousand percent more committed to it is supporting women and caregivers and the people that I touch, the people that who are providing care for me and my family, whether that is house cleaners and um, caregivers, child caregivers, whether that's, you know, beauty caregivers, nails, those things. We have to, I make a pledge. I will not be the reason that another woman is paid inequitably because there are far more women who are doing those types of services one-on-one -on -one for mm -hmm. all of us. Everyone represented here today has some kind of caregiver attached to them. And, and overwhelmingly, those caregivers are women. So I will not be the reason why another woman is paid inequitably. So I will pay, I will tip generously when I go out. Um, at least in the United States, we still depend on a tip economy. We still have sub-minimum wage, um, which we're trying to get rid of in the United States, or at least in this state, in Illinois. Um, but, but making that personal pledge to really understand we've seen it. Now that you've seen how the inequities have played out, the question is, this is a call to action for everyone here. What are you going to do? Because there is a part that we all can play in this. And uh, yes, <laughs> I hear your passion and I share it. But the other thing is, uh, if, we, if we tag back to our opening conversation about education, the effects of the pandemic that we're seeing now, because it's so longitudinal, you know, we're, we're well into the second year and, and we'll be into the third year of it very soon. And the thinking that it's going to stop and be over, I might be a glass half full person on this one, but it concerns me, you know, we have to live with it, I think, not without it. But the effect on education, if we, if we circle back to education, so many women I've um, spoken to who have picked up the remote learning and having to support children at home, albeit that the curriculum's provided, who um, have had to work from home. And if they were studying or adding, adding to their skill set and their capability and their knowledge, they've put that on hold. Uh, the women have because it, it's all too hard. Now, I'm not saying men haven't done that as well, because they will have. But that whole notion of education can pull up. And we're having long discussions in our country about the, the final year of secondary education after some lockdowns. What does that mean for students in the final year of secondary and entry into university? Well, we just have to do it differently. And, you know, the, the place of assessments and examinations even is being questioned, I think. So it, it's a really interesting time, isn't it? For absolutely. Us. And, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in a moment, I'll come back. Some questions are starting to come into the chat and Q&A. To everyone who's on today, as you have questions or thoughts, please put them in the chat or the Q&A and I'll pick them up with Felicia towards the end. Um, we'll continue the conversation for another seven or eight minutes and then I'll have some, some quick Q&A as we go to a final. So don't be concerned, I will pick them up. Let's talk a little bit more about yourself now. We've talked a lot about the issues that you're passionate about and, and the work that you do. I'm interested in knowing what you think your leadership powers or gifts are and how they, how you use them in your work. Mm -hmm. You as this leader and a change agent and um, a powerful woman with a powerful story. I, you know, I, I would have to say compassion. And I, and I want to say, because this is the, you know, I say compassion, everybody's like, oh my God. She's not a, a hard hitting, a ch whatever. No, mm -hmm. because I, I don't want, you know, women to be pigeonholed into like the, the feel good stuff. I, I, my, you know, according to um, uh, one of those standardized things, what is that thing called? Myers-Briggs analysis, yes. right? I am a learner achiever, like learning and achieving are like my two biggest strengths, which means mm -hmm. I consume lots of information. I try to understand it, and then I tackle um, a strategy or whatever it is. But the other thing that I think is important is that I have never forgotten what it's like to be the other. And because I have never lost sight of that, I am always trying to create space to bring people in because I know what it feels like to be pushed out onto the margins. And I believe mm -hmm. 
I always believe that we are stronger as a community. Um, as a leader, I solicit and really expect the team to bring their ideas and thoughts to the table. I'm not some person who thinks that I am the smartest person in the room and that I all the ideas have to come from me. I, and I think that's a mistake that some leaders make and that they drown out all the voices around them. I want smart, talented people around me who bring their creativity and their ideas every day. And I foster that creativity and that, and, and that energy. I am intently interested in what they want to achieve personally and professionally. And I commit my energies to helping that. So that, so that as a leader, that hasn't just been about the type of work that I have done being of service to other people. It also includes the people that I touch on a regular everyday basis who I work with and being really intentional and in creating spaces and opportunities for the teams. I believe that the teams that I've led and I believe that we are better when that happens. And so I'm very um, inclusive. Um, I will, you know, we can de debate and have a conversation about issues. I want to understand the challenges. I want someone to, you know, not that the devil needs an advocate, but sometimes play devil's advocate and say, well, if we did this, what would we do? So we can really think it out. And I think that women sometimes, and I, and I, have, I work at a women's foundation and we happen to have an all female staff presently. Sometimes we leave, we try to, for whatever reasons, I think in the, at least here um, in the US, a lot of the education, the way it's, it, it's meted out, it kind of like tampers down women's um, ambition and those types of things. And so sometimes we're quiet when we really have something, a burning fire inside of us. So I try to make sure to always include, make sure all the women are sitting that I hate. So I hate when I go into a room for a meeting and some of the women are sitting back away from the table, like on the wall. No, 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 no. Pull up a chair. Everybody sits at this table, right? Like you pull up a seat to the table because your idea is important and we need your voice. Um, so I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Yes, you have. Thank you. You have answered the question and um, in your own way. And it is about voice, isn't it? Like the power is the voice. And that's where you circled around to. And the whole, it's a bit of a theme. It's a strong theme. And this year, and with every woman I've spoken to in this conversation, let alone every other woman I speak to, that power of the voice, we, we must activate our voice and we must find a way to put it forward. And you do that. And interestingly, I wonder how long it took you to get to that place. And that's about developing that skill. Uh, have you got a comment on that? About well, I would, how you long can it ask, took you, you to get there? My, you can ask my mom, Lynn. I was a very vocal uh, young girl. She will say, I used to drive her crazy with my questions. Well, why is it that way? I was constantly trying to you know, challenge the status quo or particularly when I felt that things, you know, as a little girl, I didn't know about equity and I don't know, I, but I felt it's not right. Well, mom, that's not right. You know, I didn't have the big words, but I would say that's not right. So um, I did have that early on and, you know, she was, I will say she was a good sport and she may have been a little weary, um, but she was a good sport about it. And I think that's one of the things that we could all contribute through our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, the, the children we meet. It's how do we um, give that power of the voice and encourage curiosity and, and, that, and, and give the power to children to challenge, to challenge us and our beliefs, to challenge society and its beliefs. And it's that curiosity, isn't it? And um, I've talked about that with other guests in the area of STEM and science education, et cetera. So when it gets tough, when life gets tough and work gets tough and a challenge is right in front of you, how do you find your way through that? What are the elements of that? And, and where do you get the support when your confidence gets that hit? You know, you get a whack or a slap and then the confidence just drops. Um, you know, who do you go to or what you go to for that? Yeah, the, that's a good question. Um, the first thing, because we've all had those moments. I mean, it, it's just, there are times when the voices will tell you, especially when you're pushing up against the grain or you're going against the grain, you know, you can't do this. All the things we tell, particularly that we tell women and girls. Um, so for me, the first thing that I do is, you know, I become a little bit quiet and I try to, and I try to center myself and center my thoughts. And I try to resonate, you know, listen for the thing that 
you know, is resonating with me, you know, if it's that little voice, like I said, when I was a little girl, like, this isn't right. Like, what part about this, right? What piece about this decision is bothering me? What, um, you know, part of this challenge do I think is my perception that, oh, this part of it's going to be really hard. So I try to, um, you know, workshop that, I guess, a little bit in my head. But then I also have, you know, I have family, I have friends who, and colleagues that I have worked with that I can go to for counsel. So we all need, you know, mentors, we all need people, um, we need to be mentored and we need to mentor mm -hmm. other people. Um, I learn as much, I have learned in my career as much from women on my team or junior people <laughs> in my organization that I've worked with as much as I have and I feel taught them, right? Mm -hmm. I've gotten a lot, so I have to be open for that. Um, I do a lot of writing things down and workshopping and just thinking about mm -hmm. what about this? There's something about writing that's very helpful to me, at least in the process. Um, mm -hmm. And I will, you know, um, and I'm also a person of faith. And so I will pray. I, I will certainly, um, depending on what it is that I'm tackling with, like seek a uh, higher power and, and, and kind of ask, what is it that I should do here? Or what am I being asked or called to do here in this spot? Um, and so a combination, it just depends on the thing, a combination of all those things. Mm, it is. So you've become a very visible role model in your own community and more broadly, I expect. How do you embrace that? What, what does that feel like? And, 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 and what do you do with being a role model for other women? And I guess particularly for other women of color. Now this one, this one's hard because um, I always see myself as a girl from the South side, right? Mm -hmm. I, which, which has a lot of um, connotations. I would say that I said to someone, a friend, dear friend who says, oh, I'm just a simple girl for the South side. And he said to me, there's nothing simple about you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so stop that. Like, oh, I'm just a, uh, a simple girl, but I, I try to leave with my own humility. And so, you know, there have, so it's like, don't believe your own press. I, you know, mm -hmm. I try to let my work um, speak for me and I just continue to do the work because there's still so much to do. And so sometimes I have my head down so much that I don't pay attention to it. But I did have someone say to me, um, a, a coach say to me that I needed to stop and honor this path that I've been on and like what I've accomplished and, and because my mother put this crazy work ethic in me. So I'm constantly working. I'm constantly working, you know, <laughs> um, but um, the, the um, advisor said to me, stop and like, give yourself credit for all that you have accomplished. So I think it's a little bit of, you know, don't believe your own press, continue to do the work, but also every now and then just stop and give yourself some recognition and acknowledge that you have done some, you've done some okay things in your life. Um, and that, spurs me it's that smell the roses moment isn't it uh, and yeah i think uh, i think as women we don't i i know i don't do it enough and I, my partner who's listening today ray's online today and and he'll often say but you know you, you've done these things you know you have to remember you've done those things especially when you're trying to break through and um if your mum is watching today felicia's mum if you're out there today um you know don't feel bad that you put this work ethic into your daughter because as a result of his work ethic, she's doing amazing things and is, is a powerful role model to others. Um, it's really interesting. I'll, I'll just digress for a moment. There, there's a lovely um, a story on chat from uh, a lovely lady called Gila in uh, Munich in Germany talking about how her daughter was an AFS um, exchange scholar with a black family in the south side of Chicago and how much that meant to her as a German, a young German girl, and to their family about understanding about race, racial problems and the lives of black people. I'm reading just a few things from, from her comments here. So I just wanted to pass them to you because you're concentrating so much you wouldn't have a chance to see them. And they're so great, they were grateful for the sharing that that family gave to their daughter and on to them and paid it forward to them. So that's that um, living with people who have different lives and um, come from different um, backgrounds. It's really important, isn't it, to understand. It is so Living in other people's shoes. Mm. Absolutely, mm. it is so important. Sometimes we talk at each other um, or over each other. And it's, we learn so much when we just listen to another person's experience and empathize with them and walk a mile in their shoes. Mm. 
um, mm -hmm. there's so much to be learned there. And those things, um, Gila, what she learned in that experience, we can't really teach those things. We, I think yeah. they try to in different ways in our educational system, but that really just comes from living and being exposed to other people who are not exactly like you and mm -hmm. having an open heart mm -hmm. and an open mind. Mm. There's some lovely comments coming through and um, people asking for the recording. I'll just indicate the recording does get posted um, after the event within a couple of days of the event and it's on the Zonta website for people who are wanting to see the recording because so many people watch the recording rather than be with us at the moment live. And our president Sharon's on this morning too. Um, sorry, this afternoon in your world talking and thanking you for sharing your story. Well, we're not done yet, not quite anyway. What do you think are the characteristics that remarkable leaders, this is about remarkable women leaders, but what do you think are the three or four characteristics that truly remarkable leaders, leaders have in common? I think courage is one, um, because you have, to, you have to go against the grain sometimes. I talked about resilience is another. Life is full, as we have all learned, y'all, in these past 18, two years to 18 mm -hmm. months, life is full of roadblocks and challenges. So I think resilience um, and with that, being able to pivot, you know, I, as, as mm -hmm. we talked about my career, Lynn, and the different things that I've done, mm -hmm. you know, someone might say, no person can do those, like, what, what, that's, but being able to take the opportunities that are before you and pivot and make the most of them, I think is extremely important. Um, and I would also say belief, like faith and belief in what's possible. Um, even if you don't you just have a vision of it, you just have an inkling of it, as opposed there are some people who are like, I have to see it to believe it. Sometimes mm. it's believing before you really see it and then just working towards that goal. Mm. I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then there's quite a few questions coming in on chat. So I need to roll over to those. How do you see things changing for women in the next decade? Because Zonta spends a lot of time focusing on um, changing things for women. So what do you think are the things that might change or should change in the next decade? Um, well, I'll focus ho ho on the things that should and, and then just say, and they might also happen. But uh, obviously, I think we need to accelerate the uh, rate at which girls are ex um, educated around the world. We have to remove the prohibitions around education that, as they currently exist. Um, we are, as a, as, a, as a society of human race, we are cheating ourselves by not having every possible um, person um, to tackle some of these really big challenges, the economic challenges we have in the world, the global, um, um, the climate crises and challenges we have in the world. Think about if we leave girls out, these girls, I told my little niece, my niece is, she just turned 12 the other day and I said to her, there are things that need to happen in this world that won't happen if you don't do them, right? I think we need to tell girls that, right? There are, are cures for things um, uh, cancer, COVID, lots of things. Those, there's no, men don't have the, the, the market on that. Those ideas, those cures, those future Nobel Prize winning uh, laureates can, co can come um, from girls, right? And mm. so I think that's important. Um, I talked about caregiving a little bit earlier and what that means. And, mm. and we have to desegregate gendered things. So healthcare, education, housing, work, those things aren't gendered. We, like society genders them. We say, well, this is women's work. This is the type of education for a woman. This is the type of job for a woman. This mm -hmm. is the type, I think we, I, need, I, I would hope that we stop that and mm -hmm. we um, remove those gender barriers to all of those things that on their own do not have a, a, a gender assigned to them. So leaders aren't just men you know, world leaders, presidents, prime ministers aren't just, this is probably more to the United States than to some of the places where y'all are, um, aren't just men. So um, I think some of those, some of those things have to, have to change. And then this comes back to those who are parenting. We have to parent our children differently to make that possible. We have to parent them in a way that doesn't gender those things that our boys the child, the children that are raised who identify as boys and girls that we actually 
you know, they all do everything. They both clean and cook. They both do play with toys. They both play what we have to stop this. We let, you know, and, and encourage them. And then thinking about how we teach them to respect other humans, how we teach them to, um, you know, I have four sons and I have raised them to be feminists and, you know, they will explain to each other. They'll say, stop mansplaining to mom, right? They'll like have this conversation amongst themselves. We need more of our sons to be taught that so that they are men in the boardrooms and the conference rooms who don't do that. Um, so, yes. yeah. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. There's so, so many things that uh, for, for me, I'd add to that, the self-confidence and resilience. How do we get women to believe and have the confidence that they can step forward and they can go to a different career? And it is working. We are getting more and more women and girls going into STEM areas and into not into construction and into work that was often men's work. And we're getting more men coming into nursing. Uh, we'd like to get more men coming into early childhood, for example, education and so on. So it's a two-way split, isn't it? We, went, we want the gender roles to, to be different for all of our young children. So the next generation, generations after. What are you, what's, a, what's your goal for the next five years or two years if five years is too far away? Well, you know, what's your goal? A goal of yours or an ambition? A goal. Um professionally one thing i want to accomplish in the next you know five years is to see philanthropy so how foundations and government um how they fund and support nonprofits and how that and that should change it should change so that nonprofits can provide health care and paid leave and the very things that we say we talk about in the larger context that Nonprofits are on the front lines and particularly during COVID. Let's think about this. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly in the United States, many of the people who work in nonprofits are women. And so overwhelmingly we have women on the front line during a global um, um, health um, crisis who themselves may not have access to healthcare or sick leave, paid leave if they themselves become sick. And part of the reason why that exists is because the organizations that fund those organizations don't provide general operating support. They only provide programmatic dollars. So I wanna change that. I think we need to be honest about what we're asking. We need to, if someone has dedicated themselves to serving in their community at a local nonprofit, they shouldn't have to make a choice between retirement um, and healthcare and having you know, economic security for their own families as they're doing this great work. So that, that really is one of the things, it's an area that we're doing a lot of investment in as a foundation here. We provide capacity building and general operating support um, and we'll continue to do that. But if we, when I think about the millions of people who just work in, that, um, in this sector alone in nonprofits on the front line, how transformative it would be for us to change all of their living, you know, their daily work conditions mm. so that they have increased economic security themselves and including, you know, healthcare and paid mm. leave. Mm. Lovely. So it's a, a range of comments or questions coming through. One of the first ones is how and where do we ask those questions that particularly relate to policy matters? You know, where do we how do we ask them and where do we ask them? The questions that I guess you and I are pushing through about today. Everywhere. We have to talk about it at our kitchen tables. Think about it. You all at your kitchen table, you could have a future prime minister. You could have a future governor. You could have a future um, CEO or executive director. We don't know if we truly believe in the, the human potential in that now, I do, and, and particularly as it relates to girls, for sure, but for all of us, then we have to have those conversations at the table. We have had some really interesting dinner conversations. I say conversations, sometimes it sounds like they're like yelling matches or maybe maybe yeah. parliament. You, your, par, your, your parliament is much more exciting sometimes than our Congress here. And I feel like they really go at it. Here it's very <laughs> Here in Australia, they do. They really go. Right. I feel so. I, I think we have to do that in our families, right? We have to wrestle with those tough things. And then we have to do it with our friends. We have to do it with our peer groups. 
We have to do it in our, our churches and our houses of worship. We have to do it in the companies where we work. Um, that really is the only way. And so, and so policymakers, if we start that, then it'll just be part of a natural progression in the conversation that policymakers and others will also be talking about the same thing. Yep. Excellent. Um, someone else has said, could you speak a little on why you chose to be involved with Zonta, which is coming into this conversation in your case, and how you think Zonta could drive change in poor urban environments? So I, um, one, I believe that, I truly believe that in our world, the, some of the biggest changes that we've seen as a society has been because of women. And so I believe in the power of women. Um, and I think Zanta is a really powerful organization. I also believe that there aren't that many differences. So whether I sit here in Chicago or you're in uh, Brisbane or, or I think someone's in, in Munich or in Germany at least, um, there aren't that many differences. We all want the same, we all af, 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 essentially want the same things. And so, mm -hmm. and I believe that a powerful force of women working globally, raising the same issues is, is unbeatable. If, if mm -hmm. we all lend our voice to climate change and drive that, and sometimes we lend our voice to those who are voiceless. We have power and privilege. We come from rich mm -hmm. countries. We can help make change and drive change and equity in countries that aren't as wealthy as the countries mm -hmm. that we come from. We can lift those women up and lift them up in solidarity and say climate mm -hmm. change is important, even as people discount it, and, you know, like, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal in my lifetime, mm -hmm. but it is a big deal in, in, in rural communities. It is a big deal if you're the woman who has to go get the water mm -hmm. to bring back to your village and you have to go further and further to get that water and what that means for your daily work, what mm -hmm. that means for the burden on you, but also what that means for the change that that is, the change it portent that is coming. Like this is about change that's coming to um, that way of life and even commerce mm -hmm. and those types of things. So that's what, women are amazingly powerful beings. And when we lift our voices in unison and unity, I don't think there's anything we can't achieve. Mm, absolutely. Another question from Nilufa in um, Bangladesh, I think, who's a regular attendee at these. How do you face up or fight hate and jealousy? Or if a community is against you or some ideas in your organization, how, how do you face up to that? Um, just being, I think, honest and having brave conversations. So I'm a Black woman in the United States that has a history of not uh, honoring and recognizing the contributions of Black women, mm. um, the personhood, and all of those things. So there is a real history here. And in mm. my life, I have faced directly hate just based on mm. my skin color. That's mm. it. Um, and so have, so have my kids. And that's not, if I say that, the response isn't, oh, you just overreacted. I'm sure that's not what they meant. Well, I can tell you what they did and how that made me feel and what the impact is. Mm. Um, so I think the first thing is to listen to those stories and don't discount them. Don't try to tell someone that the way that she's feeling or what has happened to her is really, oh, it's really not that bad because, you know, I have somebody who, no, first start by believing whether that's someone who's been a victim of hate crime or someone who's been a victim of a sex crime mm. the first thing that we need to start doing is believing them and mm. understanding that that was a powerful story for them um and then we need to i think the woman who talked about what it was like to be immersed in another culture or at least being introduced to another mm. culture and gaining her own awareness mm. um we have to do those things we a lot of times it first happens when people go to university i think um, and in the United States and maybe other places is when you really get exposed to a lot of people who are not like you. You may come from small towns and it's rather homogenous and being open and, and, and learning about them, their experiences, and then committing to like, justice. If we say we want justice and we want equity, and there's a lot of data to show where things are unjust and where things are um, inequitable, then you lean on the size of, side of pushing for justice and equity, and you can use the data as a tool to help you drive it. Mm, absolutely. There are, there's a, a theme about voice and having voice, 
which I guess we've started the conversation about, both Charlene and Sandra have come at different angles. So uh, Felicia's talking about, I'm sorry, Charlene's talking about your voice emanating, I guess, from your home life and your upbringing. And she's saying there are so many young girls decorating their faces or bodies as a way of expression. And, and Charlene goes on to say, thinking and speaking intelligently is so sexy for a man or a woman. So how do we um, promote that idea? And then Sandra's, I'll, I'll give you both at once, is asking what are the top three driving issues for women to lift our voice? So we need to lift our voice around issues. What would they be? And how do we get, I guess, young people to see that using their voice is just as sexy as maybe expressing themselves in other ways? My, yeah, my body, oh, et cetera. Mm. Absolutely. The three issues, I think I've touched on them since we've had, we've been talking, education, uh, global warming, and then I would say, uh, or global or climate change, whatever, however people call it. And the other thing that I would say um, globally would be the economic status of women. So those three mm. things, I think, uh, healthcare has mm. to be in there too, but so the economic status and healthcare help, or they each help to get to the, like having healthcare helps you get to economic security and status. So I'm going to admit it, amend it to four things. Sorry, um, whoever asked the question. Those are the four. And then the other question is, you know, what I have seen and what I have felt, especially since last summer's um, racial um, awakening and, and the conversations that started to happen about race, a lot of those conversations are really being pushed by young people. The activism of young people you know, I see a generation of younger people who are really using their voice, um, who are challenging the status quo at a time when, you know, some people, some of us older people are comfortable, we don't want to rock the boat, right? And the young people are saying, this isn't, you know, what I said as a kid, right? This isn't right, mom, this just isn't right. Mm -hmm. And so I um, want to encourage the young people that are in your life to lift their voices, echo their voices, right? Help them you know, connect them to opportunities for speaking or to um, be on committees or those types of things. I think showing them the, you know, proactive wage, ways in which their voice, their agency and their activism can help drive change is a way that we, that we do that. Fabulous. So I'm going to wrap this. Um, I've gone a few minutes more than I normally would, but it's just been such a fascinating conversation. And firstly, Felicia, thank you so much. Your generosity in agreeing to be part of the series and, and to give so generously also of yourself and your story and your ideas and your thoughts and the work you're doing. Um, on behalf of everyone who's watching today, I want to thank you and congratulate you for your work so far particularly in the, in the work that the foundation does based on your story. And I know you'll continue to do that and what it, wherever your career takes you next, I hear that service and the pushing uh, policy to get gender equality a little closer is part of it. So we thank you, Zonta thanks you and Zonta applauds your work. I also want to um, thank everyone who's been on today. I hope you've been energized by this conversation. I certainly have, so I'm going into my day energized and some of you of course are ending your day energized so thank you for continuing to be part of the series i also want to acknowledge as we finish that around the world we have so many things affecting people's lives we have extreme fire and extreme weather uh, in the northern hemisphere in the summer with um, fires and heat um, someone's made a comment about how hot it is in salt lake city in utah at the moment um, we've seen all, and the fires in California, we've seen extreme flooding in Europe, extreme flooding once, once in a hundred years flooding. And of course, we're all continuing to deal with the um, pandemic at its height or as it hopefully um, reduces a little. So I understand that everyone is under pressure of some sort through either a natural disaster or through just life and coping with life and the pandemic and everything that's thrown at you. So. Um, for all of the women who are part of today, you're all remarkable as you are my friend Felicia and my new friend Felicia. So you're a remarkable woman, your story is powerful. And I think it's uplifted all of us today. A lot of comments on chat, if you've got a chance just to throw your eye across them before we close down about your level of inspiration 
And um, Diane Lego is a, a bit of a legend here in Queensland and she's commented an inspiration to start the day even for someone who's 80 years old. I didn't think Diane was that old. So we'll go with that and, and learning and giving back. So people at all stages have been inspired by you today. So thank you very much. Our next webinar is on the 25th of August. Our guest will be announced shortly and you will see um, the publicity for that rolling out. So thank you, Zonta. Thank you, everyone. And um, thank you in particular. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.